Hi again then guys, and so it's that time again, time for another full breakdown of an update patch in GT Sport, this time 1.41 of course, kind of a controversial one, no circuit this time, and more importantly for a lot of people, no weather. The rain has not arrived in this patch. I was actually expecting it to, because the precedent was kind of there with the Red Bull X 2019 before, where we saw it the one month and then got it in the game the next month. I was hoping they'd do the same thing again, but they haven't. At this point though, polyphony being late on something or not doing it shouldn't really surprise me anymore, <laughs> but it kind of still disappoints me to some degree. But, as far as what is in this update, we have of course the five vehicles, which is the most important part. We have the D-Type Jaguar, most notably, which we only saw in the trailer itself of course, a very nice little surprise and we'll get to that in a second. And as far as the other stuff in the update, apart from bug fixes, because I haven't fully explored that kind of thing, but what we do have is some new career mode events, we have some new scapes collections, I'm not sure if any of those scapes locations are actually new, or if it's just a collage of existing ones, it looks to be that way to me, and some new circuit experience events as well at Sardinia, but interestingly only one of the Sardinia layouts for some reason. Interesting choice, but there you go. So, of course, the meat of this update is the vehicles. We'll have to see what happens in August, of course. We might see a precedent of seeing a track in one update and then cars in a different one. But Polyphony seems to have no real set schedule for these updates anymore. They seem to be dropping all kinds of stuff. More cars, less cars, no cars, tracks, no tracks. It's weird, so predictions are getting more and more difficult. But as far as these vehicles go, you're looking at a total price of 15 and a quarter million credits. So my prediction of the D-Type costing the same as a Daytona Cobra was spot on. That's exactly what it is, 15 million, which I would actually say is perfect. 10 million, I would say, kind of undercuts the car's legendary status a little bit, and 20 million might be a little bit too much given how good it is. Especially when 20 million, you're talking Ferrari P4 and Jaguar XJ13 territory. So having two Jaguars that are the same price, that would kind of seem a bit weird given that the XJ13 is a completely different level of monster. That being said though, I want to talk about the Jag first. Now if you are new to the channel, and this is the first video you've watched, and you don't know the way things work around here, I will be doing individual reviews of all five cars. So we're not going to go super into each one, stick around of course over the next few days for those, and I will also be tuning them in one form or another as well, maybe doing some rival stuff potentially, and we'll see how that goes. But as far as my quick thoughts on the Jaguar, it feels great. Sound-wise, it's pretty authentic to the period. Certain cars just don't sound that amazing. This one doesn't, for instance. The Daytona Cobra is still by far my favourite of the high rollers for the sound it makes. The Jag sounds period appropriate though. Having heard a couple of them at Goodwood, it, it does sound like that. It's not the most exciting thing around. In terms of performance though, I was hoping that the top speed in particular would be very good. And of course the precedent is there for that in the real world, and even in Forza where it's ridiculously fast. It's pretty much the fastest car in the game in fact at like 310 miles an hour. It's not quite that quick, <laughs> of course, in GT Sport, but it is fast, that's for sure. And you'll probably see in my footage here at Le Mans that I'm easily getting it up around 180, and that's with barely over 300 horsepower. So very, very impressive. If you are looking to buy a high roller for less money than a lot of the others that can still win those events, particularly the Le Mans one, which is arguably the most difficult to win because of the top speed advantage that many of the AI cars have, like the Ford Mark IV, etc., this Jag is a good one to go for. My favourite is still the Daytona Cobra, it's still my favourite car in the game in fact, but this Jag surprised me by how much I like it actually, because the D-Type has never been one of my personal favourites, even from Jaguar, but I certainly get why people do like it, and it is an icon for a reason. So top speed is very good, handling wise it could very easily be bad, but with the tuning that I applied to it, you can certainly feel its age, you know, it's high up, it doesn't have the most downforce around that's for sure, the tyres are pretty skinny by today's standards, you can feel all of that stuff. It's not, you know, like an Audi Quattro immediately feeling great on the road, as it shouldn't. It has that little bit of a, a sway to it, a little bit of a loss of grip, fairly easily, even on, even on racing tyres. It should feel like that. That's exactly what you'd want it to be like. 
and actually the handling is somewhat reminiscent of the Aston, the DB3S, which again it should, it's period appropriate. As far as the Porsche, which was actually the car that I was initially the most excited for, because having an older Porsche not only harkens back to the roofs of Gran Turismo, like the Yellowbird, but also gives a completely different style of Porsche experience in the game, because all of the other ones are very new. So, how does this one feel? Well, this is easily, and somewhat ironically, the most challenging car of the pack. And when you say that against a 1950s Jaguar race car, that is saying quite a bit. Now, the Porsche is 100 grand, just under 300 horsepower, so it's not the most powerful thing around, but I like it. The way it handles, the way it sounds, even I think 80s Porsches sound pretty good. The handling, as I said, is a bit more challenging. The rear engine, rear wheel drive layout, the kind of flightiness that it has over the front end, with also that tail happy mannerism that a 911 will always have in its character, it's appropriate once again. It's nowhere near as challenging as something like a yellow bird, but again, it's nowhere near as powerful as something like a yellow bird. So it actually feels somewhat similar to the CTR, which was always the more underappreciated roof from Gran Turismo 5 and 6, but of course it should feel like that because the specs are fairly similar, so I think if you are looking forward to the Porsche, you'll like it. The only thing that I will say about it is that the headlight graphics in particular don't load up that well, or at least they didn't for me and they looked very bad, almost like the exhaust outlets of the Toyota FT1 where they're basically octagonal instead of round. Now I've heard that if you allow the game to load a bit more it will fix that, but for me it didn't. I drove the car for like 3 or 4 minutes and it stayed like that. So. Of course, results may vary, but that was what it was like for me. Next up then, we have the Civic, the EK Civic Type R. If I recall correctly, this one was not a premium before. I believe it was the 1997 that was the premium, not this one, the 98 shape. But again, it's very popular, it's popular for a reason. Of course, it doesn't come anywhere near my love for the DC2 Integra, but I will say that if you are a fan of the EK Civic, you definitely won't be disappointed. This thing handles very well. It feels fantastic through corners. Of course, it has that distinctive sound. It is more compact than the Integra, which will certainly appeal to some people. As I said, I'd still go Integra every time. It's not even close for me, but I know many people do love the Civic. And again, you can detune the Civic to N100. So for people who do enjoy lower level events, that might be something that's worth looking into for you. Next up we have the most curious car of the pack, the car which I predicted would be in Group 4, because I would still argue that makes more sense than what they have done with it, the Mazda Roadster Touring Car. It's not in Group 4, but it's also not in Group X. It's kind of in the one that makes the least sense, N200. And I will say something that could be potentially controversial here, but I'm going to say it because I think it's true. I believe that the only reason why this car is allowed to be an N200 is because it's Japanese. I believe that if it was any car from any other country, it would not have. It would have ended up in Group X. So that's my thoughts. I could be wrong, but I think that's the case. Now, as far as what it can actually do, interestingly, you can potentially make it seem even more OP by detuning it also, like the Civic, to N100. However, I would fairly caution you against doing that, because although that would seem like a very good idea to have a full-on touring car that's 80,000 credits to buy in N100, it's actually not that good. The handling is very good, but the straight line speed really suffers when you drop the power, so you're looking at easily three or four seconds off the pace of something like a Lancia Stratos, even around Dragon Trail. And Dragon Trail isn't exactly a long track, so if you amplified that on something like the Nürburgring instead, that's going to be a pretty huge difference. However, if you keep it in N200 or tune it up a little bit into N300, you might have a bit more use out of it. At the very least, it's going to be a very good one-make race style machine, but it will be interesting to see how it integrates into the N lobbies, not just in sport mode, but just online in general, because it's easily a car that could be OP, but it funnily enough isn't. I would have still preferred it if they'd have made it Group 4 instead, because it's a race car at the end of the day, so why on earth is it in the road car category? And last, but definitely not least, we have the Honda S800, a car which I'm actually more of a fan of, to be honest, than the Toyota Sports 800. It's a great little rival for it. It's already got more power, but still it maxes out in N100. It's a pretty nice little car. It's very good through corners, not necessarily quite as good as the Toyota, which is even more compact and even more nimble in its steering, but this one feels pretty beefy in a straight line in comparison, and of course a car 
car that's in N100 feeling beefy is a very relative term anyway. But yeah, overall, I think that the cars in the pack are actually a pretty nice mix. Having only five, of course, is something that we would never really be happy with, but still the mix of the five I think is interesting. You've got a, a bit from all over the place. The Jaguar and the Porsche are the standouts for me. The car that pleasantly surprised me the most was the Civic, in terms of how good it feels. The Mazda is probably my least liked because it doesn't make much sense, and the Honda is just kind of the, sure, it's there, kind of vibe for me. So in terms of tracks and rain and other features like that, of course we'll have to wait and see if anything possibly comes in August, but that's if and when kind of stuff, so until then be sure to stick around here on the channel where I will be doing full individual breakdowns of all five vehicles and tuning for all of them as well, maybe some money earning stuff, maybe some specific class tuning and all that kind of good stuff that we usually do. But until then, I will see you next time and for now, as always. Thanks for watching.